Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started as folks trickle in. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, in case you don't know where you are, this is the Pacific Institute webinar on co-funding water stewardship projects in the Colorado River Basin. Really happy to have you all here with us today. My name is Cora Snyder, and I'm a senior researcher at the Pacific Institute, and I lead our corporate water stewardship work in the Western United States. I'm gonna provide a short background presentation and introduce my co-host, David Pills, and then we'll be joined by our awesome panel of experts that you see here on the slide as they discuss the opportunities and challenges around corporate investment in water in the Colorado River Basin. They'll share some valuable insights and discuss their ideas on how to increase the effectiveness and scalability of corporate water stewardship efforts and investments. Next slide, please. So first, a little bit about the Pacific Institute. We're a nonprofit water research organization with over three decades of experience tackling complex water challenges through multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder approaches. Our areas of focus include water efficiency and reuse, nature-based solutions, water and climate equity, and corporate water stewardship. Much of our corporate water stewardship, uh, corporate water stewardship work is conducted in partnership with the UN Global Compact through our program, the CEO Water Mandate. The CEO Water Mandate is a global corporate water stewardship commitment platform with over 250 members from around the world. Next slide. So next, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Pacific Institute's YouTube channel after we're done. Um, in your Zoom functions, you should have access to both the Q&A function and the chat function. Please use the Q&A function to pose your questions to the panelists, and then you have that opportunity to upvote which questions you want answered the most, so please use that. It'll help us decide which questions to tackle. This is what we will be monitoring most during the webinar. As you'll see, the chat function is also open for non-question remarks and discussion amongst the audience. So now I'll share some background about the broader Pacific Institute project that this webinar is a part of. Next slide. And you can go one more, thanks. So I will be brief on this slide because I'm sure that this audience knows the challenges that we face in the Colorado River Basin, but the economic, social, and ecological importance of this river is difficult to understate. Shared by seven US states and Mexico, providing water to 40 million people and sustaining billions of dollars of economic activity, the Colorado River is easily the hardest, river work, hardest working river in the West. But we know that it's under threat due to climate change, drought, and overallocation. And we know that all sectors need to be taking action to help prote protect and sustain this river. And this includes the corporate sector. We're already seeing leading companies stepping up in the basin, but more is needed. Next slide. Since 2021, the Pacific Institute has been working on a multi-year project to help advance corporate water stewardship in the Colorado River Basin with support from the Walton Family Foundation. The project has three goals, as you can see listed here on the screen, and these are around building the evidence base for water stewardship, piloting innovative approaches, and scaling through best practice guidance in alignment with public sector goals and initiatives. Next slide. So I wanna just briefly share two of the key outputs from this project to date. The first is our Joining Forces report, which came out in May of this year and was co-authored with AMP Insights. It focuses on co-funding opportunities for water projects and David will tell us a little bit more about this report and its findings in a moment. And the second report, which will be launched later this month, is a synthesis report around the current status of corporate water stewardship in the basin and the pathways and barriers to increasing the positive water impact of corporate engagement in the basin. So look for that in the next couple of weeks. So now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, David Pills from AMP Insights. Growing up in the high desert of Albuquerque, New Mexico and the remote beauty of Northwestern Colorado, steadily moving north and west to his current home in Bend, Oregon, David has been immersed in water, land and natural resource issues throughout his life and career. After graduating from the Colorado College and Lewis and Clark Law School, David worked for 10 years at the Oregon Water Trust and the Freshwater Trust, the nation's first water trust. Today, as managing partner of AMP Insights, he works with clients across the West and beyond with a focus on program strategy and design, 
legal and policy analysis of water, land, and natural resource issues and communication strategies. David, welcome, and I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Cora. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, who's here today for sharing this time with us. Uh, it should be a, a fascinating discussion. Very quickly, um, I'm the managing partner of AMP Insights, a small water-focused consultancy in the Western United States. Um, we are incredibly lucky to work with a diverse clientele, primarily consisting of NGOs, irrigation districts, and other on-the-ground water managers, uh, working to really modernize and future-proof water management in the West. Next slide. I'm especially excited to be here today uh, to talk about the Joining Forces report. You know, this, this report uh, was an effort uh, to really spur collaboration between corporate water stewardship and the rest of the world of funders that are out there on the landscape. Um, that includes governments, it includes impact investors, it includes foundations. Um, you know, from the perspective of people working on the ground doing projects, the world of funders can kind of look like a, a, a big you know, unassembled puzzle jumbled out on the table in front of them. And this report was an effort to try to take some of that mystery out and think about how corporate water stewardship might fit with some of these other puzzle pieces. And the crux of that, the, the, the sort of seed of this idea is that, that corporate water stewardship funding is tremendously flexible, right? It's not like a huge government grant program with a hundred page grant application process, companies can kind of decide how they want to deploy this funding in a very flexible way. And that means that it can be shaped to fit with a lot of the different puzzle pieces that are on the table. And so this report was an effort to really kind of put some blueprints out there for some obvious ways to fit corporate water stewardship with different funding out there on the landscape. It was also an effort to work with companies and provide some additional ways to think about having more impact on the landscape rather than rather than offsetting uh, you know operations or supply chains how can companies really think about having a watershed scale impact in this critical basin next slide please and we came out with with three pretty high level but but hopefully very useful recommendations. The first is that there's unprecedented availability of federal funding right now. Uh, many of you may be familiar with some of the programs that are out there, but there's billions of dollars on the table. Uh, it's a great time to try to capitalize on that for corporations and implementers alike. We also uh, recommend that we deepen and develop the network of funders. You know, companies have connections to other funders, um, but we need more avenues to make those connections and we need to deepen the connections that exist. And then finally, if you want to have a true watershed impact, if you really wanna you know, do good in the landscapes where operations have impacts, our final recommendation is to consider increased involvement at that project level, uh, at the beginning of projects so that you can help shape projects on the landscape and really try to maximize impact. And all of that is really tied up in a strategy for cooperative funding. Turn it back to you, Cora. Great. Thanks so much, David, for that overview of joining forces. And I just put the link to that publication in the chat for those who are seeking to access it. Um, so before we transition into the panel discussion, we're going to do three audience poll questions just to kind of get your sense of what is the status of corporate water stewardship in the basin right now? What are some of the barriers that we face in that um, in really trying to have a greater impact? And also, what's the potential, right? If we can get through some of those barriers, how can, what's the impact that we can have? So Rob, if you can go ahead and, and launch those poll questions.
And for those responding other to question number two about challenges to corporate engagement in the basin, I encourage you to please write what else you think um, the barriers may be in the chat function so we can, we can see those responses as well. We'll give folks about another minute to answer the questions. Another 30 seconds or so. All right, and we'll go ahead and close that out. I'll end the poll and Rob, if you could show uh, the results. Looks like I can share them, there we go. Um, so checking out the first responses, how impactful do you think corporate water stewardship currently is in the basin? Looks like most people responded with slightly impactful with a few also saying moderately impactful and just it uh, looks like one or two people saying extremely impactful. And now looking at what are the greatest challenges to corporate engagement on water in the basin. Um, so it looks like there's kind of two leading barriers. One is that corporations are often focusing solely on the project implementation phase of projects. Uh, and then the other one is that corporations are not proactively uh, engaging in sustainable water policy advocacy, um, with a close third being lack of sufficient data to assess water risks and guide decisions. Um, and then we got a couple others. I'm so curious what those are. Folks want to add those in the chat. And then question number three is how impactful could corporate water stewardship be in the basin if the barriers we just discussed were overcome, uh, with the majority here saying very impactful with a range around moderate and extreme. Great. So we'll take these insights into our panel discussion, which we'll go ahead and launch into next. Um, so if we could stop screen sharing, perfect. I um, am really pleased to introduce our panelists for today, starting with um, Celine Hawkins from the Nature Conservancy. So Celine is a conservation professional and attorney with experience in Colorado River in tribal water and natural resource management. She serves as, as the Nature Conservancy's Colorado River Tribal Partnerships Program Director, where she leads the Conservancy's efforts to effectively and ethically partner with tribal nations and indigenous peoples on freshwater conservation projects in the basin. Celine serves on the leadership team of the Water and Tribes Initiative and served two terms on the Colorado Water Conservation Board in her personal capacity. She enjoys living near the Animas River in Durango, Colorado with her family. Next up, we have Peter Culp, who's the managing partner and co-founder of Culp & Kelly LLP, a mission-driven law and policy firm focused on working with clients addressing critical issues in water and natural resource management in the American West. Working with its affiliated consulting, consulting and project incubation firm, CK Blue Shift, the firm also supports a growing set of innovative enterprises, special projects, and restoration efforts that are designed to meet water, natural resource, and climate challenges. Based in Phoenix, Arizona, Peter is a nationally recognized Western water law and water policy attorney and has nearly 25 years of experience in working with a diverse client base that includes foundations and NGOs, municipalities, industry, agricultural interests, and investors. 
Third, we have Stephanie Woodward, who leads the Water Stewardship Program in Meta, where she spearheads the company's ambitious water positive goal. At Meta, Stephanie oversees corporate water strategy, water risk assessment, partnerships, and public reporting. As a consultant prior to joining Meta, Stephanie established and scaled industry leading water stewardship programs at global technology, financial services, and food and beverage companies. Previously, she developed technical and strategic guidance on corporate water stewardship at the CEO Water Mandate at Pacific Institute. Stephanie holds an environmental man master's of environmental management degree from the Yale School of the Environment and a BA from the University of Arizona. And fourth and final is Todd Reeve, the CEO of Bonneville Environmental Foundation, or BEF, and the founder of Business for Water Stewardship. For more than 20 years, Todd has led work with companies to understand business risk and leverage growing opportunities to advance water stewardship and conservation outcomes. Todd has worked collaboratively to build, help develop corporate environmental water strategies and has published numerous articles profiling pathways to achieve improved water solutions. Through this work, Todd has led partnerships with Fortune 500 companies, tribes, and NGOs to build a corporate-led water stewardship movement. So thank you all panelists for joining. We're gonna go ahead and dive into the first panel question, um, which is just sort of set the stage and talk about in your role currently, how do you interact with corporate water stewardship and corporate funding of water projects in the Colorado River Basin? And I'll go ahead and start with Celine first. Thanks, Cora, and thanks for having me. So I work for the Nature Conservancy, which is not a corporation. We are a conservation organization. And I'm a conservation practitioner. I have conservation projects and I lead program work, while others in our organization work in fundraising and corporate engagement. So my role in these projects is to help our fundraisers and our corporate partners get inspired and connected to really good projects on the ground. And if we are successful in that, I then have the somewhat challenging task sometimes of actually integrating the funding into budgets and project deliverables. I wanna mention that I've worked with both corporate philanthropy and volumetric funding. So I have a, a bit of experience in different types of corporate funding and how we embed them well in projects. Thanks, Celine. Peter, I'll turn to you next. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so, so as, as Cora mentioned in her introduction, um, you know, we are both a law firm um, and therefore doing some sort of client work related to this uh, for a number of folk, uh, as well as a consulting business that provides technical and sort of science finance support on that. And then we work together as a joint venture to try and actually build solutions that are relevant in the water and climate space. Um, so as part of that, you know, we certainly uh, work with a number of cities and NGOs that are trying to fund projects through corporate water stewardship payments. Uh, we also work with a number of impact investors that are sort of trying to explore that space. Um, and some also with some large industry that is actually trying to fund its own sort of corporate water stewardship projects, um, frequently tied to you know, issues around their own value chains and their own uh, mitigation of their own climate risks. Um, over the last, we also have then built some projects relevant to this uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we've been building uh, something known as Blue Commons, uh, which is a sort of first ever blue bank, uh, similar to the green banks that operate in the renewable energy space. The idea being to provide through revolving loan funds uh, sort of credit support and technical support of various kinds to projects that are relevant potentially to corporate water stewardship. And that includes providing sort of upfront technical support to folks that lack capacity, um, providing project financing to help get projects to the point where they can potentially uh, benefit uh, and, and sort of partner with corporations that are interested in this. Um, and then helping uh, to sort of monitor and manage the benefits in a way that make it relevant to corporates. So. Thanks, Peter. Stephanie, I'll go to you next. Thanks, Cora. It's so wonderful to be here today. Um, I am the water stewardship lead at Meta. Uh, Meta has been supporting uh, water restoration projects since 2017. And in 2021, we set a goal to be water positive in 2030. And 
um, in order to reach that goal, we're going to restore 200% of the water that we consume in high water stress basins and 100% of the water we consume in medium water stress basins. Um, we've been working in Arizona for several years as well. Um, now I think we have eight or nine projects um, within the state and the Colorado River Basin totaling um, around 400 million gallons per year. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Looking forward to hearing a little bit more about those projects later. And Todd, off to you. Good morning, everybody. And thanks so much, Cora and Pacific Institute for hosting this and inviting us all to participate. Very pleased to be here. I'm Todd Reeve. I'm the CEO of the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, where I've been for the last 23 years. Um, our work with corporates is built around one of our marquee programs at the organization called Business for Water Stewardship. And this is a programmatic effort that is now increasing outside of the United States with both international and domestic um, participation directly with companies to help understand what their goals and objectives are related to water stewardship and help facilitate and curate and make those connections to on the ground water stewardship and resilience projects that can both address water security and resilience needs and issues in catchments of need and interest while delivering specifically to the goals that the corporates are setting and the, the tracking mechanisms and the risk management elements that they have within their programs. To date, I think we've funded about 90 different projects across 12 um, different countries um, and at least 25 or so US states. Um, and we continue to work with more and more large and small companies that are stepping up and contributing to this work, learning about needs on the ground, just exactly as this webinar is about to explore what pathways could deliver more impact and how can that be integrated within um, the corporate strategies, the corporate delivery mechanisms that can increase impact on the ground. Thanks, Todd and all for providing that context of how you're coming to this work. Uh, and I'll hand it over to David for the next sequence of questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, obviously, we have a, a great panel here with, with a tremendous amount of experience and perspective on this. And so next, we're going to really dig into the basin that is the focus of this webinar, and that's obviously the Colorado River Basin. Um, so starting starting sort of at a, at a high level and kind of from the beginning, uh, I want to ask the panelists, how do the companies that you work with or, or yourself to the extent that you reach re, um, represent a company and, and some, uh, how do you all identify and collaborate with other funders currently to co-invest in water projects? Um, I can jump in, I guess, as a um, representing a company. Um, I would say probably most of the projects that we invest in, we're co-investing with other funders. Um, oftentimes that's other companies working in the same basin who have similar goals as we do. Um, there are also um, government funders or philanthropic um, funders as well. It's a, it's a real mix, I think. That's great. Thanks, Stephanie. Todd, I wonder if you might say just a quick word with, you know, you have such a broad perspective on the landscape of, of funding. Um, I'm curious if you have some thoughts on how companies are currently yep. connecting to fund projects. Yeah, sure thing. And since we're at the outset here, I'll, I'll oversimplify, but I'll say generally speaking, the majority of companies are looking to scale impact and they're looking to do that through collective impact, participating with more entities on the ground, participating with more co-funders, leveraging federal funds. Extremely difficult for companies to do that because they may be looking at a portfolio of projects across a dozen or more international sites. They may not have sort of the local capacity to spend the 10 years on the ground developing a high impact collective you know, solution. And so what we see is for the most part, companies have been relying on entities on the ground, entities like the Nature Conservancy, entities like Blue Commons, tribes, NGOs, cities that have put in a decade's worth of time building the components of an integrated higher scale 
collective impact scenario. So the companies are eager to find these, they're eager to participate. Typically, they're going to have to rely on the on the ground capacity, the time that's put in to help develop these relationships and de develop these projects. I think we're seeing the beginning of companies, especially in under resourced rural or kind of difficult locations to begin investing in different ways to help be sort of a foundational partner in building these kind of impact solutions. But for the most part, the vast majority of companies are hoping that they can find and align with a set of players that have already built out a, a solution that can be relatively easily integrated into the corporate goals where multiple companies then can participate in financing or supporting an outcome. Yeah, and just to echo that, I mean, that's in fact something we've spent a fair amount of time really trying to do, um, which is to kind of bring projects forward to the point where they can benefit from this kind of funding. Um, but uh, I think as sort of Todd's suggesting, um, I think in some ways the places where that's been most productive is where um, we've been able to identify uh, corporations uh, like Meta and others who are kind of willing to meet those projects, um, maybe a little more towards the middle. Um, it's challenging. Um, you know, there is a, a sort of huge lack of capacity for project development um, as well as funding for it, um, which is... I think left a number of folks who would really love to be expending money in this space, kind of waiting for someone to show up uh, to the dance to dance with. Um, and instead, it's really you know, to the extent that we can work together to begin to cultivate some of the projects to the point where they can benefit from that. Um, that's really key. Um, and that's been, you know, for example, a, a premise of the Blue Commons project is you know, what's needed here is, uh, you know, sort of bridge support to get projects to the point where they can, de you know, demonstrate the quantifiable benefits that folks want to invest in. And I would echo that and just note that a lot of the conservation NGOs and our partners on the ground, we are talking a lot and thinking about this as a project pipeline. So, and we're not doing this in a vacuum for developing all kinds of innovative solutions to meet the challenge that we find ourselves in in the Colorado River Basin. So we consider right now to be an all hands on deck, all projects move forward moment to meet the crisis that we're facing. Some people see it as a water security crisis. Some people see it as an ecological crisis. Some people see it as a cultural and spiritual crisis. And we're just looking for the best solutions that we can move forward, but we're also recognizing that while it is taking less time than it used to to develop these projects because of the circumstances in the basin, it still takes a tremendous amount of time, trust, and capacity to get these projects to where they're ready for corporate funders to engage, and I think corporations could be engaging earlier in that process in really productive ways. Um, the other thing that I would note is that the there is more state and federal funding at play right now in the Colorado River Basin than I have certainly seen in my, you know, somewhat mid-sized career in the basin. So I think that there are extraordinary opportunities to be thinking about sort of public, private, corporate packages to get projects done now. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, thanks, Celine. Those are both really good segues uh, to some follow-up questions I have. The first one is about impact, right? And this is related also to the, the poll that we did at the top of the webinar. Um, I'm curious for the panelists to comment on what scale do you think corporate co-funding could realistically achieve in the basin? You know, it's a, it, as Celine says, there's a tremendous diversity of challenges. It's a big geography. Uh, and the depth of of challenges in the basin is is hard to overstate. And so I'm curious for some thoughts on, you know, what is what 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 is the top end here? What can corporate water stewardship do? So I mean, I'll try and take that on initially. I mean, I think it could actually be a really significant source of funding going forward for a variety of things if we can sort of get past some of the barriers that are sort of standing in the way of that. Some of those barriers I think are kind of cultural and or sort of self-imposed. Others are, I think are, you know, are fairly real. Um, but, you know, I think that the sort of challenge in some ways to, uh, 
to kind of bring that to scale is also to just recognize the scale of the problem that we're trying to engage with um, and recognizing that, um, you know, these problems are, uh, and the sort of risks you're trying to address are, are, are not just, you know, sort of discrete, small sort of problems. They're systematic um, and connected to a lot of other problems. Um, and with that in mind, um, I think both, um, there, you know, there's a, has been a tendency, I think, in the and, and an understandable one in the sort of early years of this, to I think approach these problems somewhat two dimensionally, in the sense like we're going to try and you know we need to offset demand, and so we're going to manage demand, right? Um, and that's a really useful thing to be doing, particularly if it can be done locally in the right geography and the places where those impacts are being felt not always the case, right? Sometimes investments are occurring in a different place than where the impacts are really being felt. Um, and addressing those things locally might actually mean, you know, thinking about a different project or thinking about projects at a different scale with more trying to leverage more funding, right? Um, which is how you would get there. Um, similarly, you know, not all problems are, in fact, a demand problems. Uh, the Colorado River Basin is a great example of this sort of throughout the West, where um, you know, just a fun little statistic is that so every year, about 170 million acre feet of water fall on the Colorado River Basin as precipitation. And all of that water translates into the 12 or 13 or so million acre feet that we actually get to enjoy as the civilization that depends on that watershed. Um, that means that pretty small changes in the landscape can cause very significant changes in the water budgets that we're dealing with. Um, and so we can manage some of those challenges by managing our own demand, but we can't necessarily work on the problem of nature not giving us what we need um, because of things that are happening in the landscape due to climate change. So anyway, I mean, I think to the extent that we can begin to explore um, both ways to leverage funds, ways to ensure the impacts are targeted in the places they need to be targeted, and um, and thinking multidimensionally about the problem that we're trying to solve so that the corporate funding is being used to solve, you know, the hard parts of these problems. Uh, that are have proved harder to fund or, or harder to get to. It has a huge amount of potential. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Stephanie, I'm curious if you have a, any thoughts just from your perspective. You know, when when Meta thinks about its potential in the in the basin. Yeah, I think. I mean, there are there are several sort of levers that we have to make an impact. I think the first is being efficient in our operations, um, using recycled water where we can, or just taking steps to maximize the efficiency, kind of reduce that demand piece. Um, and then there's the, the restoration side of the equation. Um, we're taking a context-based approach to our goal setting. So that's why we have the 200% target um, based on our consumption. Um, and I, some a theme that's kind of been coming up is the the need to also engage with projects earlier, um, and so we also have um, a part of our program that I think is kind of unique, where we're investing in catalytic projects within the watershed that don't necessarily have a volume a volumetric return, um, but can help prime the pipeline for more um, water restoration projects in the future or help build that capacity um, so that there's greater project availability, not only for Meta, but for others who are also looking to, to get involved in these types of projects. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, Stephanie. And I think that's one of the things we discuss a lot in the, in the Joining Forces report is how do we use how do we help corporations deploy their their funding in a way that unlocks things, right? Like, how do we how do we make it so that one plus one isn't two, but one plus one is like three or four, right? Um, and that that's also kind of a, a good segue. And, and Celine, you teed this up also. Um, you know, we talked at the top of the 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 webinar about the unprecedented availability of corporate of pardon me of government funding right now, especially federal funding, um, and so. 
Uh, I know from other discussions that it's not just that simple, you know, corporate funding plus federal funding equals amazing impact. So I'm curious, um, maybe starting with Todd at the high level and then drilling down, what are you seeing out there? Um, you know, how, how can companies try to leverage their funding with this availability of, of federal funding? Thanks, David. And the group's already touched on, I think, many of the important points here. And hats off to Stephanie and her leadership for for doing ex responding exactly in the way that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think the corporate impact can be truly outsized. But it isn't just funding, right? It's funding and influence together and engagement. And we look at the changing West, and it's not just a landscape of mining and, and irrigated agriculture, right? It's some of the the most the fastest growing, most vibrant economic conditions in the Western United States or in the country. And so the importance of these companies, of the people they employ, of their business strategies is of incredible, incredibly high relevance to policymakers, to the entities that really could push on some of these levers that would create, you know, solutions to some of these systematic challenges. So when I look at what is the potential for scaled impact, absolutely, it's through funding and all the things that we're going to talk about today and sort of changing the way that we approach that. But it's also through engagement and action and communication that is going to encourage um, policymakers and communities and entities that create, you know, water conservation codes and that sort of thing to realize how fundamentally important it is to solve this. So I think we've got tremendous potential to leverage this sort of corporate horsepower that's emerging. So that's one piece. I think in terms of scaling up impact, and we'll get to barriers in a moment, I think it is exactly what Peter and Stephanie described. Um, this movement is quite new. If we think about when the first companies started investing in, let's call them, I call them environmental water stewardship projects, it wasn't very long ago. The rules are still being created, the standards, the staffing mechanisms to achieve these things, they're all in process right now. And one update um, related to Stephanie and Peter's comments is there has been a disincentive um, for companies to invest in early phase actions, so-called enabling conditions that could lead to and leverage much, much larger benefits. And the reason is many of the corporate systems are set up to reward and incentivize projects where you have no risk around implementation and you have very, very clear certainty regarding implementation timelines and outputs from the projects. So when we talk about, and there's going to be a theme of this panel, which is the earlier you invest as a catalytic enabler, the more potential there is to scale impact, just like a venture capital investor, right? You don't wait until the very last moment to put your money in. You do it early because the scale of impact has much greater potential. But, but heretofore, there has been a disincentive, which is if you're a water stewardship coordinator at a company, you're going to get fired for doing that because you can't present clear timelines and expectations on how and when your company is going to be able to talk about and demonstrate these positive outcomes. So one positive update is there is a um, an endeavor underway right now to try and write a different rule set that we're generally calling um, enabled volume benefits to try and identify how important it is to support this early phase catalytic action and how society in general needs to reward or incentivize these companies by giving them certain claims or certain outputs that they can benchmark against their sustainability goals and objectives. So that's something that's in process. I personally am very hopeful that we all can get this across the line and it will be a bridge to the kind of higher impact, early impact strategies that we're talking about here today. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think with regard to federal funding specifically, um, the, I mean, and right along the lines of what Todd's saying, I completely agree with the, you know, what is, it's important to recognize that the enabling condition with federal funding is in very, is to a very large degree capacity driven and sort of capacity related. Um, you know, for example, uh, with projects that we are working on, um, both presently and previously with tribes, um, you know, it's extraordinarily difficult for a tribal government to actually access federal funding, even though there's tons of it potentially available at the moment. Um, but, you know, if anyone's ever filled out a federal grant application, um, particularly some of the ones around, you know, restoration, even, even hard infrastructure, it's no small undertaking and certainly not for the faint of heart or people that 
are massively overburdened with other responsibilities. And, you know, most tribal governments are effectively doing all the work of a state government, but with the resources of a town government typically, right? And so finding, you know, the time to fill out an application, finding experienced grant writers, being able to invest in the design of a project that you need to have effectively completed before you can even apply, um, being able to come up with required match um, that needs to be sometimes in hand before you can even write the application. Um, you know, all of those things are big uh, sort of obstacles that corporate funding, um, which can potentially be used much more flexibly, creates an opportunity to leverage money in a way that's very difficult to do, even with philanthropic money, mm -hmm. which is frequently available on timeframes that are different than the federal grant money um, is being made available. Um, and so that's a place where, you know, that recognizing that ability to leverage the outcome and caring little less about what's funded so much as ensuring what is the outcome of the funding that's spent is a potentially a great way to get a lot done for not much money. I mean, it's, it does not cost a ton frequently to plan, design, project manage, all this other stuff that is sometimes impossible to fund with federal money um, compared to, you know, when there's, and, you know, and that a relatively small expenditure can leverage millions and millions of dollars of, of federal funds very quickly. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I think that's all great insights. And Celine, I'm curious from your perspective as a, a, pra a practitioner, do you have some federal funding identified? Do you have some projects that you're working on that, you know, I'm, I'm just curious what your perspective is on this and how corporate funding may or may not be playing a role in your planning and, and project work? Absolutely. And yes, we do have projects that currently have corporate funding that we've applied for federal funding. So I've thought a lot about this. Um, so I agree with everything that Todd and Peter said. I would underscore that capacity to get projects to the point that they're ready to apply for public funding is a gap that we have. And it is particularly acute in disadvantaged communities and tribal nations. And that is something that we are actively working on. I'll take a step forward to the scenario where you have a project that is ready for, you know, application for state or federal funding. Um, and I would say one of the um, barriers that we've run into on projects is an annual volumetric commitment and accounting. So we totally understand why a corporation would want this. You have your sustainability goals. You need things to be accountable. We run on metrics as well. But what this has done is it's actually stifled some of the budgeting creativity to go after really robust sort of state and federal public packages with corporate funding. So if we could use the corporate funding a little bit more flexibly, even if we're delivering that volumetric commitment over a slightly different time period, we could leverage it sometimes like 12 to one with the public funding that's coming in. So I think that's really a place to think creatively and maybe is the place where corporations could work really closely with conservation NGOs or municipalities or tribes to really take a hard look at, does that annual commitment really make sense if it's gonna drive the public funding applications lower or do we sort of plan across different time horizons to get the best bang out of the corporate dollar? That's something that I think about a lot. And then the other thing that I would mention that came up in one of our applications where we were leveraging corporate funds against public funding is that I saw in the America the Beautiful Challenge that Natives in Philanthropy actually sort of took their funding to the federal agency and they made a commitment to provide all of the match needed for any tribal applicant in that program. I thought that was really innovative. They're doing some crazy innovative joint collective funding work with philanthropic funders. But mm -hmm. I thought that's really cool because a tribal nation is sort of thinking about it, thinking about whether they have the resources and suddenly their match commitment is covered 100%. 
that starts to change the dynamics of how those projects would work. So I think that corporations can be working with project teams and with other funders, but might want to consider the public funders and whether there's a way to sort of drive innovation or certain types of projects through commitments like, hey, we'll cover match, we'll do this if it's this kind of project. That's an awesome idea. I hadn't heard of that. And it's great to great to hear. And I think that's really a perfect example of how to how to try to do this, how to do co-funding, right? Is making commitments like that, looking for other opportunities to do that. That's a that's a great example. Thanks, Celine. Um, Cora, I'll hand it off to you now for the next question. Great, thanks, Devine. Um, so a lot of high level ideas so far. I'd like to kind of bring it down a little bit more to a, a project level and talk about some examples. You all are working on a lot of great projects within the basin. Um, so I'd love to just go around and hear about an example of corporate co-funding for water in the basin that you have worked on or are currently working on. Give us a little bit of the details about that project, about how the co-funding has worked um, and any lessons learned from those examples as well. Um, so does anyone want to kick us off? Peter's off mute. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to stay off mute. Sorry. Uh, happy, yeah. happy to go if if that's helpful, Cora, or defer to Great, yeah, well, Todd, go okay. ahead. Great. So one project um, that many, I'm sure, uh, participating in the webinar um, are familiar with and, and maybe participated in is an ongoing collaboration with the Colorado River Indian tribes. And this work started probably six or seven years ago. Um, and there was a tremendous need for match funding to leverage tens of millions of dollars in state funding and make a significant contribute to shore up water levels in Lake Mead and the lower Colorado River Basin. It seemed an immense challenge at the time, um, establishing a new working relationship with a large and important tribe on the lower Colorado River Basin, working with potentially many companies and a state agency to help accomplish that, uh, um, accomplish this outcome. It was one of the, the most successful collective impact um, programs and projects that we've worked with to date. I think we had 13, 12 or 13 companies coming in collaboratively. Um, and that led to many, many things that were not fully expected at the time. Um, first of all, it allowed for a deeper level of engagement between the tribe and the corporates, allowing the corporates to see some of the challenges that Peter's describing and to begin pondering what some of the pathways might be to continue to enhance tribal water infrastructure and support lower basin water resilience objectives. Today, we're, we're I think, at the fourth or fifth iteration of working with companies to support um, these infrastructure projects on farm efficiency projects with the Colorado River Tribes um, in partnership with Blue Commons. We just secured a $3 million grant to enable additional benefits and outcomes. And so the storyline on this one is by establishing a meaningful relationship, by bringing in a dozen or more companies and being authentic in our engagement, we've been able to string together a whole series of investments that relate to canal infrastructure, to on-farm efficiency, to leasing and following for system conservation to shore up levels at Lake Mead, and now are even leveraging additional funds, federal, state, otherwise, to go bigger. And so when we look at what are we trying to accomplish through this corporate water stewardship work, this is a, a perfect example. Longer term, deeper investment, and increasingly participating in some of this early phase work that can enable the kind of bigger outcomes that are will benefit the tribes, will benefit the river, and, and have great potential as well to benefit non-tribal communities in the lower basin. Thanks, Tom. And any lessons on that or you know, road bumps along the way, things you guys have learned? One super important lesson that ties directly to much of the work that Celine has led which is it is incredibly improbable that my organization or a company is going to establish a meaningful, robust project relationship with a tribe. Um, the meaningful relationships are born out of decades or more relationship building, sometimes often led by entities like the Nature Conservancy that's been able to put in the 20 years to build those relationships, often led like entities like Blue Commons, where that relationship has been in existence for a very long period of time. So when we look at unlocking some of these larger scale collective impact solutions, 
I continue to see and believe that we will unlock those through existing relationships and partnerships and leveraging again collectively as opposed to possibly going in an isolated fashion, you know, knocking on a door and saying, hey, we're here to help. Does anyone know of some, you know, really high impact solutions? So especially with the tribal projects, really deferring to the entities that have built and managed and sustained those long-term relationships are in the best position to know how to continue to structure and build and deliver benefits and authenticity to the partners on the ground. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Peter, you want to go next with a project to share? Yeah, sure. Since Todd called me out earlier. Um, the uh but yeah, and actually just while we're on the subject, Todd's, the work that Todd and his organization have done is just tremendous. Um, and I think it just can't be overstated how important it's been in getting things like the CRIT project moving. Um, a, 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 the project I was going to mention uh, is actually another uh, project that we were working on with BEF um, through the Blue Commons entity uh, that's been referred to a couple of times. Um, that uh, is a, a, a revolving fund that is targeting uh, industrial cooling conservation uh, initially within the city of Phoenix, but also in other cities. Um, the notion there, uh, which is a pretty neat one, is that, um, you know, this is a uh, industrial cooling doesn't sound very sexy, but it's a, as a sort of something to work on. But it is an enormous problem from a sort of municipal water use perspective. Um, within the city of Phoenix, it's close to 30% of all the non-residential water demand within the city. Um, and it's a significant user of water in most cities. It's also very hard to target with conservation because the it's you know these are big capital intensive um, pieces of infrastructure for which the water costs are a really small fraction of operating costs for most of the folks involved. And uh, while the the uh, sort of upgrades and things that can be done that will save considerable water aren't terribly expensive to do, they don't tend to rise to the top of the list of things that people have prioritized for their capital facilities. Um, effectively, the way the fund works is it's uh, supporting uh, sort of an augment to, the, to an existing municipal water conservation program uh, cities uh, frequently and you know routinely do audits of their larger customers to look for opportunities for water conservation. Um, and in this case, uh, once uh, when opportunities are identified in a cooling tower facility, uh, of which there are you know tens of thousands uh, within the city limits uh, within Phoenix, um, the customer can effectively be offered a free upgrade. To their uh, to their cooling tower, which they agree to pay for by essentially paying the difference in the savings on their of their municipal water bill, and so the upgrade can be installed. The city then verifies and monitors the outcome, calculates what the customer would have paid, but for the conservation, and then they're not really out of pocket anything uh, in exchange for doing the upgrade. Um, and then that verification in turn creates a lot of well, it's very well documented, very reliable um, sort of water savings that are, you know, causing real conservation within the city water system, um, uh, you know, that everyone can really count on having occurred. Um, and those, by doing that, the fund can effectively then, um, you know, is repaid relatively quickly by the customer. The customer is not out any money and there's a lot of benefits uh, thrown off from it. Um, I think you know a couple of lessons out of that have been just how useful it can be to, to structure uh, projects like this in a manner that's highly relevant to the local jurisdictions within which you're operating. Um, the city has become really one of the biggest backers, not just of the, of the cooling water fund, but of the Blue Commons Blue Bank entity itself, uh, Mayor, brings it up constantly, um, including at like the UN water forums and everything else. Um, and they've been you know, marketing it heavily with customers and really pushing hard to get these, these projects done, which are complicated. But the city has invested so much of its own capacity and capital in it that I think it's moving, um, you know, while these things always move more slowly than you'd like, it's moving at lightning speed compared to what it would take to do it without them. Um, 
and you know they're excited enough about it and it's received you know it's been successful enough in its early stage of implementation that the city then has actually then gone out and supported a state a big state grant that will be used to expand the program to cover not just Phoenix, but potentially a whole bunch of other metro cities in the Phoenix metro area and in the Tucson metropolitan area, um, and potentially go to other places as well. So it's been a great, sort of a great outcome all around. Thanks, Peter. And can you clarify a little bit more on how the corporate funding or corporate engagement fits in here? So you said it's augmenting an existing city program and also now leveraging some state funding. And so where um, where does the corporate fit in there? The corporate funding is effectively um, um, buying the benefits from a water conservation perspective, um, both uh, providing, in, in, uh, in some cases, some of the upfront support to actually get projects up off the ground. But definitely uh, sort of covering the cost so that um, the, uh, you know, although the customer will ultimately repay it, um, that money, um, it can be laid out to build the project to begin with um, by essentially purchasing the benefits that are known to occur. Got it. Thanks. Celine, I'll turn it over to you next for a project example. Thanks, Cora. So for the past few years, the Nature Conservancy has been working in partnership with the Hickory Apache Nation and the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission, which is a state agency, to build a really innovative water sharing agreement that achieves multiple benefits. There's an economic and revenue side of the project for the Hickory Apache Nation, which lost a multi-million dollar revenue source when coal-fired power plants started shutting down in the San Juan River Basin. For the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission, there are ecological and water security aspects, as well as testing a, a state tool in the San Juan River Basin. And then there are um, significant ecological benefits of this project. There is an endangered fish recovery program active on the San Juan River Basin, and flow and habitat restoration are key components of that endangered fish recovery program. So this agreement allows the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission to lease up to 20,000 acre feet of water per year over a 10 year period. So up to 200,000 acre feet that gets released from Navajo Reservoir and deployed in the San Juan River. Um, and we'll be using an adaptive management approach over those 10 years to look at both the water security and ecological benefits of the project. Corporate funders are participating in the project. They are funding the costs of doing the project, which include you know, the, the water lease itself, as well as capacity for the nation and some of the costs around the science and monitoring for the project. So it's been really fun to engage with corporate funders in this space. Um, they came on, you know, relatively early in the project, but after it was sort of ready to, to deliver that kind of benefit. A um, few lessons learned on this project. One is this, this is the project that I identified that that annual delivery um, of sort of volumetric benefit could potentially get in the way of sort of multi-year, really strategic leveraging of public funding in the project. So really good lesson learned and something that we'll know moving forward with corporate funders in that project. Um, a second thing that came up in sort of figuring out how to integrate corporate funding into this project is needing to be really, really careful about what the Nature Conservancy was agreeing to in funding agreements with corporate partners. Um, and this really came down to sort of what corporate partners were asking to be able to do. And I think there's a big difference, and all, all of us on the panel would recognize, between actually taking an interest, a property interest in water, and being able to sort of make a claim around corporate sustainability. But that line can be a little bit fuzzy sometimes. And so one of the things that we ran into is that anything that looks like we're creating a new marketplace, particularly one that hits on those sort of red hot matters of upper and lower basin and negotiations, but also on this concern that we have throughout the basin that we're gonna see sort of buying and drying of agricultural communities wholesale with real harm to rural communities. 
I don't think any of the corporations thought that they were sort of playing in that space, but we had to ask some questions and really clarify things in some of our funding agreements. So I would I would pay attention to that. I think there's a difference between claiming credit for having funded a good project and actually saying, I want a piece of that water or we are creating a, a water market. Those are two very different things. Um, so you know, these, I think these are things that can be overcome and sort of how corporations engage with projects, but are, could be real barriers to scaling up. And then the final thing I would mention is that nearly everything that the Nature Conservancy does is in partnership. In this particular project, we have two sovereign government partners that really care about how we talk about the project. And so we had to ask for some special provisions in all of our agreements to make sure that we saw the corporate sustainability statements before they went public. And it was really a little bit less about the Nature Conservancy and more about making sure that our partners were okay with what was being said about a project that they are affiliated with. And so I think that when it, you know, this is probably applies when we're working with any partners, but particularly when we are working with government partners that are at the table in big policy negotiations, it's going to be really important for the corporations to make sure that the messaging works for those kinds of partners. Thanks, Elaine, for sharing that. I'd, I'd love to there. quickly point out an unscripted um, unique element here, which is Stephanie and Meta have has played a critical role in all three of these project examples. Um, and in some of the cases, like the industrial water cooling, Meta's early and catalytic role actually was fundamental to being able to leverage $3 million through other state and federal funds. So it's it's great to have Stephanie here and to appreciate that fact that Meta played an early phase role on all three of these really strong collective impact um, examples. So thanks, thanks Stephanie. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for flagging that talk because I asked Stephanie to talk about a different project so that we didn't have overlap and could really get you know, the diversity of projects happening. Um, but it's really uh, important to note that. So thank you. Um, Stephanie, I'll turn it to you. No, I mean, thanks and so much gratitude to all of Meta's partners who are on the call and, and you know, others in the basin as well. Um, I feel so privileged to have such innovative and thoughtful partners in this work. And um, yeah, so happy to be a part of all of these projects in some way. Um, the one that, that I'll highlight um, came about in 2020 as, um, you know, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, water access, access issues became um, even more acute um, on the Navajo reservation in Arizona and elsewhere um, because of the the health implications of, of having access to water in the home. Um, I learned at that time of the work that uh, the nonprofit Dig Deep was doing on the Navajo reservation to help communities gain reliable access to water in their homes and um, reached out to Todd and his team at BEF to see if we could connect with Dig Deep to help to develop the Navajo Community Water Supply Project uh, with Dig Deep to support that work as part of our water restoration program. Um, I think, you know, lessons learned on that for me, it was our first uh, wash related project within our water restoration portfolio. So there was a bit of sort of internal education around um, you know, why we're investing in a project that's so different from all of the sort of landscape scale restoration projects we had done previously um, and kind of making that connection. It also has, you know, lower volume return than a lot of those kind of big um, nature-based solutions focused projects. So really kind of making the case for those co-benefits um, and, you know, and I guess just kind of bringing that a new a new type of project into our portfolio um, was you know a learning opportunity for many, uh, but now I think it's one of the most um, the the projects that people connect to the most um, and are really proud to support. So um, yes, we're very happy to have that project in our po portfolio, and I think it you know. Being an early mover in that space with Dig Deep also helped to pave the way for other companies to um, support their work as well. Um, so 
yeah, it's been a really great experience working with them. Thanks for sharing, Stephanie. So as you can tell, just a lot of great work happening throughout the basin, a really you know, diverse set of different projects from you know urban efficiency to you know irrigation and agricultural upgrades and stream flow projects, water access, you know, really running the gamut of the of the different dimensions of water in the basin. Um, and I think I would also just call out, I mean, I think part of you know Meta being involved in all of these projects is a, a testament to Meta's leadership, but also I think a sign of the relatively small pool of leading companies that are currently engaging in water in the basin. And I think that's an important thing to flag. There are a couple of companies that are doing amazing work, but we know that that tent could be way bigger. And that is one way to increase the impact, right? There's these innovative co-funding and other approaches that we can use to increase our impact, but growing the community of companies that are engaging in this is, is another important lever. So I, I just wanted to flag that. Um, we're going to go into our last set of questions, and so I just wanted to say to the audience, um, feel free to start kind of inputting your questions in the Q&A, and after this final uh, panel question, we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience questions and go from there. So the last question that I have is around, you know, kind of corporate decision making and investment, investment in water stewardship projects. We've touched on a lot of these themes already. But I would love to hear about, you know, what are some of the key considerations for corporations in deciding how they allocate their water stewardship budgets, um, and how could companies maximize impact within the constraints that they have around their corporate water stewardship strategies? And Stephanie, I might ask you to kick this one off, um, and then we can go around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of, you know, project selection and how we're thinking about um, project funding decisions, there are a couple of criteria that um, that we consider. The first and I think the most obvious is the volumetric side of things, understanding that it's an imperfect um, measure and doesn't tell the whole story or provide the full you know scale of impact um, necessary in the basin. I think it is in some ways a stepping stone um, for companies and one that I don't think is going away anytime soon. We do need to um, really have that accountability and transparency around our um, supportive water restoration projects and don't want to be seen as, you know, greenwashing. So I think that's why that um, rigor around volumetric reporting is is there. And um, while, I don't know, it, it can clearly get in the way, sometimes I think it's sort of necessary. Um, I think other, you know, sort of co-benefits that are important that we consider are um, any ecological biodiversity co-benefits, um, climate resilience, environmental justice. Those are all things that I'm thinking about as we're looking for projects, as well as, um, you know, great partners, um, that type of thing. And then um, there's also, as I mentioned before, that sort of non-volumetric or enabled benefits piece um, that I think is so, so important and would love to do more of in uh, the Colorado River Basin as well, just finding those projects that can help build capacity and unlock future projects or sources of funding or really allow us to get more creative um, in how we're, you know, spending our corporate water stewardship budgets. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely hear that the double edged sword of, you know, the legitimacy that the volumetric accounting brings to corporate water stewardship, but also the constraints that that can present as well. Um, other results want to chime in on this question? Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I would I think those are really those are great core three things. I would probably add maybe uh, five more for what it's worth. Um, everyone knows me knows I think in fives. So it's always five. But the, um, I think the, you know, first of all, I guess I would say it really is worth, I think, looking specifically at sort of what the regional needs and interests are. Um, you know, can you, you know, find projects that really align well with watershed plans if you're doing restoration or like in the city uh, context, you know, what is the real need, right? I mean, you know, the, City of Phoenix didn't need someone funding toilets or things like that that are sometimes easier to qualify. They had something that was really hard to do that we could design a program around that was then really meaningful to both the corporate partners and to the city 
which is, you know, what you're really looking for. Um, you know, the second thing would be, I think, really focusing on the scaling opportunity because this stuff matters most if we can um, really start to address climate risk uh, in the way that it's beginning to manifest and at the scales it's manifesting. Um, and that means thinking about not just what you're funding, but also how you fund it, right? Uh, leveraging opportunities to get the other public funding or opening, uh, Stephanie has met multiple times, sort of opening opportunities for other corporates to enter um, and maybe do the things that are, who are at an earlier stage of thinking about this to kind of get in and start learning uh, how to do it. Um, related, I mean, I think is really just thinking about the right geographies because water is very local. So being relevant to the impact you're really trying to, to get at or the the offset you're trying to, to actually achieve, I think both helps build the legitimacy of these things as investments and also makes it more rewarding to make them, um, both in terms of getting actual risk reduction as a result of it and from and sort of benefiting the communities you're working on. Um, and then I guess the last two things would be, you know, um, uh, sort of implied earlier, but like fund the things that are hard. <laughs> the things that are hard to fund because the thing that's a pretty uh, you know assuming you can sort of overcome the hard hurdles of sort of being able to draw the volumetric benefit and those other sort of essential criteria um the corporate funding is far less encumbered in many ways than the other kinds of funds that are out there both in terms of when it can be available what it can be spent on um you know federal funding rarely covers even you know two thirds of the costs of a typical project. There's just so much stuff that ends up having to be either be invested, sort of pro bono or covered from elsewhere that gets in the way. Um, and you know, charitable funding uh, frequently has similar limitations. And you guys can be flexible, um, and that's something that's really powerful. Um, and I think is something the private sector can really bring to this is a higher level of innovation. Than is sometimes possible to get with more traditional forms of money. Um, and then I guess finally is like just thinking about the story that you want to tell um, with the funding that you're providing. Um, it's clearly will have to be a volumetric story and it may have to have, you know, some of those other kind of essential aspects, but um, you know, but what is it you actually want to say about what you're doing? If you're working for a tribal community or working with a tribal community, um, there are other real needs there that make a great story for that funding. If you can help to address the, you know, capacity needs, um, or, you know, be able to provide funding over a length of time with a level of reliability that makes it possible to like hire a new person or, or run, you know, help some kids get through all the way through their, uh, master's degrees or something like that anyway so i mean i think it's like what's the story you want to tell um with the money that you're giving away beyond just the kind of the sort of minimum criteria that you need to meet for volumetric accounting and so forth thanks peter sorry that was long that's answer. Great. i love i love the five it makes it easy to remember <laughs> um and so i'm uh, building on that i would love to dig more into a theme that we've already touched on related to this corporate decision making around investing earlier in project pipelines and this concept of you know catalytic or enabled investments. Um, and Todd, I'll turn to you first and maybe a little bit more about the forthcoming um, guidance for companies on this concept of enabled benefits. And then Celine would love to turn to you too to think about that that gap, that capacity gap that you see and how corporations can play a role. Great. Thanks, Cora. You know, in the context here is I'm very, very sympathetic to the various things that corporates are trying to solve for, right? These companies were not designed to go solve wicked water problems in the Colorado River Basin. They're not staffed for that. They don't possess the expertise. So sometimes when we hear people calling for all these changes and they ought to do X, Y, and Z, it just isn't realistic. So when I think about what they're really trying to solve for, they need public support and relevance. What they do has to be relevant and it has to resonate. They're looking for scale and impact and they're looking for certainty. They think that that will roll up to social license to operate and water resilience, which ultimately is reducing risk, right? 
the problem that I see is when we add this list up, you put certainty in there and that is entirely counter to the concept of kind of a venture capital mindset. Like let's invest early. Let's assume risk because we know that, you know, putting these tribal students through their master's program has potential to generate incredible outcomes. It's unpredictable what those outcomes are. So it isn't particularly well suited. So when I think about, and I kind of look at this a little bit differently, I see right now companies as this work matures, companies are being forced um, by society to demonstrate more and more clearly that every single dollar, every single claim, everything they everything they support, you know, down to a you know milliliter of water is a proven impact on the landscape. And so I would say we really need to work hard. I would say the foundational barrier is society imposing restrictions on these companies that are completely counter to what we're describing here. And the more you see inside where this corporate movement is, you'll see the companies are faced with a very difficult decision right now. Should they spend all their time and resources on precision accounting of how many drops they got from their project? Or should they lean into the impact narrative, which is what we're describing today? So I do think we're at a perilous crossroads of sort where society is probably going to dictate based on the forces and the lawsuits that they apply to this corporate funding, how they use the money. The worst case scenario in my mind is we spend all our time and resources around precision accounting and third party auditing so that every company's claims are absolutely buttoned up and risk free while missing out on the impact opportunity. So for me, that's, you know, that's what I, if I could change anything, it would be change society's perception of how we can utilize these companies, assets, resources, connections, relationships, products to achieve these bigger outcomes on the ground. We're trying to crack the door to your question, Cora, by creating a different set of rules right now that says, if you come in early, you take risk, and your investment um, generates a much, much larger 20X outcome. Your early investment leveraged 20X federal funds. Your early investment helped a municipality or a tribe apply for 15 federal grants and they got eight of them. To be able to say that that larger collective impact result came through your corporate investment and you deserve to take some claim, right? Narratively, quantitatively, whatever it may be, that you are a smart actor, you came in early, you saw this gap, you used your money in a clever way or your resources, and you you scaled this impact. So that's the work that's underway right now through a acronym VWBA, Volumetric Water Benefit Accounting Framework, that's trying to add that piece of the puzzle to the corporate toolbox, if you will. Many companies won't be able to use that for a variety of reasons, some of which are around the fact that their goals were already established for the upcoming benchmark. But some, Meta is one example, are have already been moving in that direction. And this would provide additional clarity, additional incentive, I believe, to, to reinforce that these kind of investments actually can generate higher impact, more relevance, and de-risk the company's work. So it's not easy to, to move in this direction, but I think it's a bridge strategy. I think it opens the door and keeps pushing the door further open so that everything we're talking about on this webinar, we can continue to move in that direction. And maybe it's the next set of corporate goals that are established, lean more into this impact narrative and maybe enabling these outcomes than just sort of funding projects at the last second. But I also want to be super clear, this corporate funding is immensely valuable regardless of where you input it on the continuum, right? And so the work that's been to date has been tremendously impactful but we're just trying to kind of open the door so there are more opportunities, more pathways to use this money in ways that can leverage bigger outcomes. Yeah, thanks, Tan. Selena, over to you. So I wanna take a second to just remind all of us that we're working in a basin where we're facing a lot of water stress. There is not enough water for all of the people and uses in the basin. And that is not forecasted to get better when we sort of project what drought is doing to the basin. And so if I got to manage a sort of corporate, you know, pile of funding and get to put it out, I would really be thinking about how as a society, we're going to do more with less moving into the future. And the way I think about this is that 
the Colorado River is already a hardworking river. What is it, 17 times that each drop is used as it flows, you know, down from the mountains to the Delta. But like, we're now going to have to have each drop of water doing multiple things on its way down. And that I think that's the reality of where we're headed um, as we think about how our society and the rivers themselves might thrive into the future. And so I think that might help corporations take a hard look at sort of what they're funding and also might pivot the funding a little bit earlier in project design processes to make sure that there's enough money at that stage of the project to think about all of the wins you could get, all of the uses that you could get out of a single drop of water, and to really start thinking about like what the how high impact could this project be moving into the future? So again, I recognize that there's risk in that, but I think that we are in such a water stress state in the basin that if you want to go to scale, if you want that kind of impact, you should be engaging earlier in the projects. The second thing that I would say is I think corporations need to be thinking about policy work at all levels. We need to have the right set of tools available and the funding to implement this at scale, and that is probably not going to come from the corporate sector. And I would flag that this includes capacity within the state and federal agencies to deploy funding, which can be a real challenge if they get big windfalls of funding to get it out the door in a way that makes sense. So I can't sit here today and tell a corporation where they should engage, but I, I think corporations should be taking a hard look at it in the context of they might not get their projects done on the ground if those enabling conditions are not in place. If we don't have the right tools, if we don't have public sector support, we don't have public funding coming in. The last thing I would say is that three of the four projects that were discussed today had tribal partners among other partners. So that's a space where there hasn't been a ton of investment. There's a lot of need. So I think really right place for corporations to think about placing some of their funding. Great. Thanks, Celine. Any other comments on this piece? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, no, and, and Celine's points, I think, are really good. Uh, the, the one thing I would just note in the within the policy sort of side of things is I do think that we have not potentially mobilized the, the kind of influence that actually corporations making kind of public commitments to do stuff um, could have. Um, most of the agencies, most of the cities, the folks are confronting these issues on, right up front on the ground, um, I think really are looking for, first of all, I mean, they're looking for their own license to operate, <laughs> so to speak, right? Um, there, It's unprecedented levels of risk. You know, you've got cities that are, I think, really worried about being, continuing to be attractive to the kinds of industries that drive economic development. Um, they welcome opportunities to kind of partner with the corporate sector in ways that are, you know, that show that we're all working together and we're trying to solve problems together. I think the federal government, same thing, right? I mean, the opportunity for, you know, Bureau of Reclamation, I mean, those poor people end up throwing, you know, billions of dollars on kind of paying people not to use water one time they're really struggling to, you know, find those longer term, more permanent benefits. Um, and that requires innovation um, and new models. Um, and that's something that the promise of some corporate funding as a means of like just buying down the costs of some of those uh, projects or, you know, demonstrating a way that we can all work together uh, to count, come out with a good outcome, whether it's on a tribe or in a farming community or what have you, um, that's really attractive to them politically. And I think is potentially also hugely influential in the public policy debate where I think it's too often felt like um, the you know sort of business community has been just sort of a user of the water systems um, and less of a steward of it. I think the corporations, you know, like Meta and others that are sort of stepping forward and saying, no, no, you know, we're we see the we see these risks. We have our own commitments as an enterprise, as a corporation, to manage not only our own risk but sort of participate in solving problems. You know, 
that's a really important part of this story. And I think something that, I mean, I know TNC has, as have we and others, have done a great job of transforming uh, corporate investment into um, you know, pretty good stories that are influential with policymakers. So, oh, thanks, Peter. Um, so we're going to go ahead and shift into Q and A. So those listening, I encourage you to put your questions in the Q and A function so that we can read those and have our panelists respond to them. Um, and I see one that came through the chat, which we'll go ahead and start with, which is, what advice would you give to a company that's looking to get started or deepen its engagement in water stewardship in the basin? Well, I'll punt this by going first and saying, I would pick up the phone and call someone at BEF and talk <laughs> talk with them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Todd, that's really a pass off to you. <laughs> wow, that was unbelievably generous, Celine. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'll say that I think the highest level piece for us is before you set goals, before you lock in a budget, before you make promises of what you're going to achieve on your corporate you know, stewardship commitments, do the work to communicate with people on the ground and understand the landscape, the need, and the opportunity. The biggest challenge that we see is companies getting really excited about the ability to participate, making a lot of commitments early that then hamstring them to the types of solutions that may or may not respond to what the panelists are describing. So I think there's a fair amount of homework here, and it could be talking to Stephanie, Peter, Celine, a host of other cities, tribes, NGOs. But understand what the needs and the opportunities are before you back yourself into a corner and, and find yourself in a very difficult um, situation to one, achieve impact and to meet the goals that you've set. Absolutely. I just want to chime in on that one. Stephanie, curious to hear from you. Yeah, um, well, I would second Celine's um, comments and Todd's as well, but working with BEF has really been transformational and incredible experience. Todd and his team know the basin so well. Um, all of the projects that we've engaged with through BEF have been like very high quality, impactful projects. So can't recommend working with them enough. And I, I think, um, you know, as great as the challenge is in the Colorado River Basin, we're also so rich in great partners um, in this region. It's not true of every place um, where I'm trying to source water restoration projects. I really, you know, have to commend everyone on the call and and all of the organizations that we work with. But we're just so lucky in the basin to have such great partners and people who have been building these relationships for decades. And so I think my advice is just partner with those who are you know, experienced in the basin and have been doing this work for a long time and have great and innovative approaches to the problems. Well, the only thing I might add to what's been said, which is, I think, all great is, um, you know, for some, I, mean, I think it's definitely true that for some um, of the folks that are kind of getting into this now, the um, and I'm thinking in particular of a couple of folks that we work with closely, the sort of the uh, the sort of drive to begin putting resources into this is sometimes coming from um, you know a different part of the corporate leadership um, and and is not necessarily always tied to the folks that are operating on the ground within the company. Um, and what I've seen in a couple of it, examples is the early engagement with the actual folks in the value chain of the company uh, that are down on the ground to understand where water climate risks and all that stuff actually are really going to hit home <laughs> and what they're worried about has actually created a pretty a, a better um a, you know a sort of better license to operate for lack of a better way to describe it, within the company itself uh, for the corporate sustainability officers and others that are really trying to figure out how to integrate this, you know, with, a you know, potentially a big far-flung operation. Um, and I think some of the coolest projects that we've seen are often found in that sort of interstices between 
where you know an operation really is is sitting, whether it be a data center or a factory or whatever, in the community that it's in, um, and you know you can find projects that are impactful at that scale. It's then I think just you know it helps engage the workforce of the company and uh, local leadership and the folks that have to set operating budgets and all that you know sort of day to day work of running a big enterprise and get them engaged in thinking about it too. Thanks all for those responses. Um, so I'll turn next to the question that's at the top of the Q&A, which is around kind of how to um, have critiques around corporate water strategies and policies, right? So this uh, question from Madeline says, how can we create necessary dissent about corporate water policy as it continues to take shape in key flora and basins? Ironically, investors and especially the insurance sector are themselves asking for more robust and public critiques of corporate water strategies. Any initial thoughts on that one? You do a quick rephrase, Cora. Yeah, I think I'm sorry. I'm looking for it in the list and not seeing it. Apologies. Yeah, so I, I think maybe we talked about you know corporate engagement in water policy, but also thinking about how corporations are crafting their own water policies. And Peter, coming back to what you said a little bit about how you know businesses have historically been really users of water and not necessarily stewards of water, and how does that evolve? And how do we have a process that allows for um, public engagement and others to kind of have that input on what corporate water strategies look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super quick, just a, a shout out to the CEO Water Mandate and Pacific Institute. I think the concept of the net water positive impact strategy and the recent clarity on what that would mean for companies from my perspective is a huge step forward saying it isn't, it's not a singular piece of the puzzle, right? It isn't just use as you know, little water as you can in your operations or fund a few projects in your neighborhood. It's a collective and integrated set of best practices related to corporate water policy. So I feel that great advancements have been made around the concept of the net, net water positive impact strategy. And I think that's a great starting place um, to, to continue to refine and demonstrate what best practices can look like for a corporate water steward. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, in keeping with that too, I mean, I think better, you know, doing a better job of, I mean, I think this is false, not just on corporates, but everyone who's working with them of telling the stories of how this stuff has been effective and why um, is probably important to just sort of influence sort of the public perception around this in a way that's helpful and really more instructive. I think the you know, the understanding of what corporations are actually doing is pretty limited. Um, I think on the policy front, you know, I've been continuing to kind of push on on the sort of rules and guidelines around this. Um, you know, for example, like the SEC, you know, the recent uh, sort of stuff coming out of the SEC, which, you know, had some neat stuff in it, but there were real problems with the way that they were thinking about building the accountability around water um in terms of how local it was going to be and, and things like that there's a lot of things that we can be thinking about uh, to sort of influence that and then i think from a terms of engagement though i i think in some ways I, I would tie again back to the idea of sort of working with the local jurisdictions working with the local partners um those whether they be tribal governments or ngos or cities or whoever like those folks are frequently where the public is actually engaging um, with the projects that need to be done and built. And so working closely with those interests and sort of finding out what the needs are, kind of as Todd's saying, like, do, some, do your homework, find out what's really needed and what the opportunities are um, before you engage, rather than setting a set of standards that you're going to hold yourself to that may or may not be relevant to the folks that you really need to impact um, is a good way to, to do that. 
Um, and so rather, you know, and provide an opportunity for public engagement while still kind of being able to be true to your own principles and needs. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And I, I think that it definitely continues to be a challenge. And I think also when you're talking about global corporations acting in, you know, very local um, circumstances and local policy arenas, what does that look like? Um, and also just from a capacity perspective, right, as Todd mentioned earlier, like corporations are not necessarily set up to that. So then how do they bring in the right partnerships and expertise to help them, you know, help support that? I know, like, you know, Stephanie is the water person at Meta and so in their global corporation. And so how does she then find partnerships to help her engage in, the, in those local fora? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to David for a final question, and then we'll close out. Yeah, that was, uh, you're, you guys are anticipating all my questions, which is very helpful as a as a moderator. Um, you know, I want to circle back to the discussion about um, enabling benefits and, and catalyzing projects at the seed, you know, the seed stage and the idea stage. And I think one question I have for you that I'm genuinely curious about from a practical perspective is, how can companies find those projects? I mean, potentially these are just ideas in someone's head, right? Um, if it's someone like Celine at TNC who has already built relationships with companies, you know, that's one thing. You reach out to the people you know. But if it's if it's someone who doesn't have those connections, how do we build forums for those kinds of projects to come out, right? In the venture capital world you have pitch conferences, you have, all, you know, you have other things, right? There's, there's people out there actively looking for investment opportunities. How do we build something like that? Or what's the right way to do that? Once, you know, once we, there just seems to be a lot of agreement around this enabling benefits concept. And so I'm curious about some, you know, quick thoughts on how to operationalize that. I can go first. I, I do think that having, you know, some sort of pitch conference makes sense. And I'm thinking of the Nature Conservancy has been working here in Colorado on sort of an innovation and in agriculture concept. And they pulled together a bunch of funding, including public funding, and asked, you know, producers and irrigators to sort of bring their ideas in on sort of a competitive process. And the applications that got sent into that process were really incredible. And there's money going to these good on the ground projects. So I would say you could poke around like federal grant applications and see like which ones didn't get funded, but you could also invite people, you know, and sort of set the stage for, we know we're looking for innovation. We're looking for early stage projects. Come tell us about what you're thinking. And I think a lot of people would show up with some amazing ideas. Yeah, it's a great question, David. And I do I do think we have to be really careful on that continuum of sort of innovation and risk. Where realistically could a company end up, right? And it isn't going to be at the extreme margin of that continuum, right? But there is a space in there that we already know companies are showing up and they are looking for those things. So just to share a couple of examples, there are entities... Um, and companies that have partnered with us and others on RFPs, similar to what Celine is describing, where and when companies realize, wow, we've got a really flexible and potentially high impact role to play. And these, let's just say, you know, tiny little transactional projects that we see in front of us don't measure up to the impact that we really want to play. There is an opportunity to get the word out, right? And use partners like the Nature Conservancy or Blue Commons or Water Start based out of Las Vegas or others that have been aggregators of this sort of innovation. And so I think there are even uh, the, the impact investment space, right? Where we know there are other entities playing in the basin that are, they are bringing together you know, they're they're casting a broad net, they're identifying where are these potentially scalable high impact opportunities. I think we have to right size it because I've been communicating with a lot of people about this and they're saying, look, I've been burned so many times before because everything we pull in that's exciting and interesting has too much risk or isn't baked enough and that kind of thing. So I think regardless, there's still a gap that we need to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to manage that. How do we get from raw ideas and the word we use a lot is curate and curate those to the point that you have a viable package that provides enough clarity around. These are the benchmarks. These are the steps. Here's where we want to go with this. 
an unbelievable example, and TNC is an immense lead on this, is market transformation, right? Across the basin, and Peter talked about it, changing land use. The, the fundamental opportunity to just solve this problem is around changing markets. What do we grow with the water that we have available? How do we maximize the benefit of every drop? But the infrastructure, the market capacity, all of the pieces of the puzzle that are required for a super smart farmer to say, that makes sense and I'm going to grow a different product, don't exist. So there's lots of calls every day saying, hey, Todd, do you know any companies that would just underwrite, you know, exploration of how we transition markets in the basin? And the answer is just no, right? That's so uncertain and so risky, but yet it is the biggest lever that we could push on. So I think there's work here for the NGOs, for the partners on the ground to try and take those raw ideas and find the ones that we can curate and put into a, a form that actually is viable to pitch and get someone to take on. And that's where I think it's different than venture capital. I'm not sort of involved in the financing world, but I think sometimes it's like, if you write the, if you meet the right person at a concert or on the golf course and you pitch them on your idea, you know, they write a check. And I just, I don't think it's going to work that way. And I think it's probably worth saying too. I mean, I think there is some real value in, um, you know, because the space is complex, because it takes time to curate projects, as Todd's saying, to to really sort of look for opportunities to kind of work with some of the infrastructure that is standing up to do that, which, you know, reflected by folks on this call um, and elsewhere, where, you know, I think one of the things that, um, like once we become, you know, if we become aware that there's someone who's willing to fund a particular kind of benefit and to do it particularly over some period of time that creates then the opportunity to like um sort of match people together to get an outcome uh, outcome done which i think we're not at least i'm not seeing in sort of competitive process kinds of strategies because unless there's a lot of money that's at stake you're just you know you're going to get potentially a lot of good ideas, but not very many actual ones and one and something that requires potentially a lot of energy to to manage. And so some combination, I think, of what Celine's describing, but also sort of investment in the sort of in relationships with entities that are trying to put those projects together and stack funding together to kind of get to those outcomes is really helpful. And so, you know, as Todd was suggesting, communicating early and often about what it is that um, you're interested in can kind of help to, you know, to find those opportunities that are going to be hard to find just working completely on your own. So, Cole, Todd, any, any thoughts on that before <laughs> uh, before we close out? Um, really interesting discussion and I'm taking notes over here about how we can improve our process um, for sourcing these types of projects. I love the idea of sort of a curated pitch competition and maybe we can work on that. Um, but I think all of these comments really get back to the idea of collective action and really kind of pooling efforts, pooling resources towards a shared goal and, and outcomes and working with other stakeholders in the basin, other companies, nonprofits, um, government entities. And yeah, I think it, it really does all come back to that idea of collective action. Well, I, th I think that's a great note to end on. I want to just heartfelt thanks to the panelists and my co-host, David for participating and sharing your ideas and insights today. I think it's been a, a really fruitful conversation. I hope that those listening have found it to be helpful. Um, before I close out, I'm just gonna share my screen um, one more time to share the resources that this project um, has put out so far. So one is the Joining Forces Report, which we have talked about a fair amount. Um, and a lot of the ideas that we've talked about today are encapsulated in that report as well. And then the Pathways and Barriers report, which will be coming out in just a couple of weeks. So keep an eye on your inboxes for that. Thank you everyone for joining and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Cora. Thank you, Thanks, Cora. everybody. Thank you.